I'm here to present the John Bingham Herbert Award for Teaching Excellence to Professor Robert Weisberg, my fellow New Yorker. <laughs> professor Weisberg is as dedicated a professor as you can find, and he's a delight to watch in class. One student described watching him teach as, as a similar experience as to watching fireworks. His thoughts are amazing and they're constantly bursting and surprising you as you, as you go through the class. Professor Weisberg teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, and white collar crime. And even though his subject matter, the subject area that he teaches is quite complicated and many areas of the law is dense. Sorry, the bell. Uh, <laughs> Is that he has a knack for explaining the difficult issues in a way where his students become fully engrossed in the subject matter to the point where they start to really understand the law. The mark of a great teacher is one that could not only teach the, that one, one who does not only teach the basics, but one who piques the student's intellectual curiosity in such a way that they are enabled and feel comfortable and ready and prepared to challenge the law as it stands today. Professor Weisberg does this for every single class. <laughs> Beyond his teaching, what really sets Professor Weisberg apart is his complete dedication to his students. On our first, back in 2010 when we were 1Ls, on our first day at, in criminal law, he made it clear that he was always available to talk, not only about the doctrine, not only about careers, but about anything, including the New York City weather. And he was always ready for, he was always willing to talk to just about anything. When you spoke to Professor Weisberg, you always felt like he was listening he was completely interested in what you had to say and was listening closely. And many times he would refer back to, to a small detail you had mentioned to him months earlier. And I would continue to be shocked that he remembered some minor detail about my personal life that I had mentioned. And this... <laughs> but this is an experience that's been had by many of my classmates. Beyond that, he... <laughs> Beyond that, he was always ready and eager to help with any issues or any projects uh, students had in mind. And for that, he, is the, he supervises more directed research projects than any other professor. And he is presently the faculty advisor for several student-led projects, including the project we made, Pro Bono Project, and the San Quentin Prison Project. Professor Weisberg is incredibly accomplished and he's one of the most humble and thoughtful and kind people, persons that I've ever had the, the opportunity to meet. And my, many of my classmates and I are now incredibly honored to be able to call him our friend. Please join me in congratulating Professor Weisberg on his achievement. It's a particular honor to be uh, introduced by someone who knows how to speak the King's English like all of us do from New York. But anyway, I <laughs> uh, want to say uh, in echoing Matt a quick shout out to uh, not just our staff generally, but particularly to Jillian and Jason and our fabulous facilities group for putting together logistics for this great event. So I wanted to thank them. <laughs> I'm also pleased to see uh, here up uh, on the stage our great former dean, Larry Kramer. As you know, Larry. Yeah. Uh, a worthy predecessor to Dean McGill, who is a worthy successor to him. Uh, I want to say, as you know, Larry left last year uh, to uh, run the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, he left 
the, uh, the comfortable uh, confines of the academy to go to the real world. The real world where you have $10 billion to give away <laughs> whenever you want to. It's flattering to be rewarded for teaching such fabulous students, but here, and I'm betraying my colleagues by blowing any negotiating leverage with the dean, the opportunity really has been its own reward. And I've had the opportunity for a long time. People keep reminding me that I've been here a very long time <laughs> at the law school I attended and the only one I've ever taught at. Now, this is somewhat exaggerated. It doesn't really seem that long. It seems like just yesterday that I was teaching in room 190 and a student was surfing on her Marconi radio uh, and, 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 and shouted that finally the Cardozo nomination had come through. Uh, there was another day I was talking to some students in the law lounge when the law school telegraph machines were buzzing with blog posts about the chances of the Sherman Act passing, but all right, I've got things a little mixed up. Okay. Now, no literary form, of course, uh, is so vulnerable to cliches as the commencement speech. And since, as a teacher once told me, we should avoid cliches like the plague, let, <laughs> let's, uh, let's turn a bit of a critical eye on them. Now, there is, of course, the obligatory reminder that commencement means not an end, but a beginning. <laughs> Here we have what logicians call, I believe, the semantic fallacy. Uh, you know, what kind of beginning is it that's so drenched in tearful farewells? I'm also supposed to say that this event occurs at the precipice, precipice of a unique historical threshold, or maybe the threshold of a unique brink, uh, <laughs> a time of unmatched peril and promise in that you are a unique generation. Uh, I don't feel competent to offer such historical de declarations. Uh, and as for your generation, I have a hard enough time remembering the distinction between the aughts and the millennials. Uh, but in any event, I'm wary of any categorical description when the subset we admitted to Stanford was picked precisely because you defy generalizations. So I'm going to keep my focus a bit narrower. I'll return to the subject of commencement cliches in just a second, though I should warn you that there's a cute one I like and I'm going to use, the takeaway. So I think I have a few takeaways. Law students here have become even more wide-ranging and interesting in recent years. My own perch in criminal law has been especially gratifying. Of course, crime is special, the place where the rubber of law meets the road of life, where one can wallow in the day's tabloid news and pop celebrity culture and claim, I'm doing research. <laughs> uh, but it's not unique. The range of our students' intellectual, professional, cultural, and personal backgrounds has widened as the study of law has become more interdisciplinary and our students are better at it. But it's also because our great clinical program has brought our theorizing into contact with the ground level of law and the demands of professional practice. I find myself learning from students in one day how the esoterics of computer technology and even philosophical concepts might inform how we devise rules of privacy and other students on the same day, or even the same students, updating me on how they justified, devised a strategy to win a 1538 argument, uh, and then a 995 dismissal and an 113050 case in the high volume local court. I know just seeing those statute numbers with a knowing edginess is a joy to you. <laughs> you've done also, you've done much of your work as teams with each other and with faculty. As noted in uh, the recent Stanford Lawyer magazine, uh, the Stanford Criminal Justice Center has undertaken a comprehensive assessment of the new California law called realignment the most dramatic reconfiguration of any American criminal justice system in half a century. I've been lucky to be on this team in this endeavor with my very special colleagues, Joan Peter Cilia and, Deb and Debbie Muckamal, <laughs> with whom I have the good fortune to share the leadership of our center. But the key has been our team of student researchers. They've done empirical data collection, case studies, statutory analysis, policy evaluation, and a few months ago, the governor of California, Jerry Brown, came here to receive a briefing from our students. He was so impressed that he declared he had to take the reports back to Sacramento to discuss them with his administration and the legislature, and that he wanted to steal some of the students as interns for his office. Joan, Debbie, and I view this as an, an it doesn't get any better than this moment at the law school. 
except we're going to stay at it because it may indeed get better. <laughs> oh, by the way, you're going to accuse me of continually being defensive about the been here so long thing, but as I told the students, how long could I have been here? They have been in students at Stanford Law School under Governor Jerry Brown, and so was I. <laughs> But just who are you, you graduates? Some years ago, I suggested to some 3Ls that they ought to look back at their law school application statements to remind themselves in times of doubt or uncertainty of what they anticipated they would bring to law school and what law school would offer them. So this year, I decided to ask a bunch of 3Ls, I know pretty well, for permission for Faye to give me their statements. I wanted to see how some of you described your path to here and conceived the possible path from here. And I thought I could offer some observations on these essays. Now, of course, I guaranteed confidentiality and anonymity, and I should stick to that. But intellectual integrity requires me to break that guarantee for one statement. And I apologize, but I just have to. And I quote, it's disturbing and remarkable. <laughs> I view Stanford as the ideal place for the solitary pure intellect to confront the abstract eternal principles of law. <laughs> law cannot be learned amid the dross of the populace. <laughs> st st Stanford could be my monastery of learning where I can lead a life of asceticism contemplating the cold, impersonal, timeless logic of justice unencumbered by vulgarities of society. <laughs> Uh, signed, signed, uh, Jake Klonoski. Uh, okay, that didn't work out well, that one, but on the whole. In reading these essays, you see that our applicants don't need to reassure us of the easy stuff, that they can become pra competent practicing lawyers. The essays tend to reflect wider interests that might lead people to law. Most of them have a kind of charming random quality, a kind of soft epiphany where a challenge, a job task, an encounter with an unfamiliar culture has told you things about yourself or given you a sense of where you want to go. We rarely see, nor would we want to see, essays that describe a linear premeditated path to law school, the kind where the applicant says, at the age of five, I was already winning dinner table arguments. <laughs> I, I just knocked out my rivals in high school debate, and I'm confident of outgunning everyone in the, in the law school classroom and then destroying them in the courtroom. <laughs> now, the best essays are short story-like snapshots, moments of change and revelation where some, some experience or a task that might seem irrelevant to law peaks in, pardon me, peaks interest in how law might be connected. You wrote of medical challenges, potholes in the road that prevented you from the artistic career you planned, but which led you to redirect to a legal career that might offer parallel satisfaction, or health challenges that once overcome were a step toward the confidence you needed to take on some previously inconceivable educational goal. You wrote of how an immersion in the esoteric mechanics of finance led you to appreciate how societies and economic meltdown can find a way to recover. You wrote of a political encounter over a moral dispute at college where you came to appreciate the much maligned art of lobbying as the way good things get done. You wrote that time spent in politics first tempted you towards cynicism until you realized that law is not the cure for politics, nor is politics the, the corruption of law, but rather that law is what helps make bad politics better politics. You told us of coming to appreciate that growing up in a place actually identified as the poorest town in the United States could offer riches, riches of a different, subtler sort. You wrote of idealism in urban school teaching, but intriguingly observed that idealism is often the easy part when you're young, that the trick is to learn and respect the mundane pragmatics. You wrote of a return to an ancestral home in Africa, or on a government assignment in Afghanistan, where you realized, as one of you put it, that the challenge is to rescue choice from circumstance. You argued that international trade is a step towards speeding democratic values, and you told of learning how a deep Christian commitment matched with fluency in languages could lead to diverse opportunities for public service. So here's a takeaway. If your paths to law school were so indirect, even circuitous, why should your paths from law school be fixed and linear? Remain open to change. Be prepared to be buffeted by a bit. Be in the moment when job or personal change happens, but also step back and watch it happen. 
Sometimes we look back and things that had looked accidental appear to have had some destiny about them. But the reverse is perhaps more telling. Sometimes we look back to the nature and consequences of choices and appreciate how happily accidental the occasion or the consequence of those choices have been. On that score, back to cliches for a moment. The commencement speech often admonishes you that when it comes to a difficult decision about how you conduct yourself in your profession or whether to redirect your profession, always be true to yourself. The bad opposite alternative is to acquiesce in the expectations of the marketplace or worry about the opinions of others so you end up trying to be something you're not. Now, I don't mean to denigrate authenticity, but I think we need to think this through just a bit. In Hamlet, when Polonius gives the advice about being to thine own self, be true, uh, be, about uh, being true to thine own self, sorry, Bill. <laughs> if, if indeed he wrote that. Uh, uh, it's not so clear that Polonius was offering a high moral lesson. The speech is more about social strategy. Where does the supposedly fixed authentic self come from, if not to some extent from interactions with others and imaginings about what you might become? Look back to those application statements and you'll see as stories of change, there are also stories of how you imagine yourself could be different from and better than the way you viewed yourself at the time of the writing. Okay. Self-invention is very American and is not inauthenticity. The notion of the self-made man, always stereotyped as a man, has a long but rather degraded history in the US. Someone who didn't inherit money but became rich is always self-made. But there's a nobler version of self-invention. To venture outside law for a moment, one of the people I admire most and find most fascinating is Oprah Winfrey. How did a woman who grew up in poverty and suffered horrible abuse end up in a few decades to be a judge the most influential woman in the world? If you look to her story, at some key point, she created a concept of herself as someone who could spin raw speaking and conversation skills into being a worldwide advisor to humanity. She couldn't become what she is until she imagined it. Oprah invented Oprah, and she's no less authentic for the achievement. Closer to home. A few months ago, some of our students met Michael Santos. Michael is one of our leading commentators on sentencing and correctional policy in the United States. He's written great scholarly articles on criminal justice, and it will play a major role in criminal law reform in the coming years. But Michael invented this self by an act of arduous muscular imagination when, at the age of 23, he was sitting in a federal prison for drug crimes he has never denied. He imagined the self that he could be at the end of a certain 25 years of federal incarceration, which he did serve, and it was only because he had that new self in mind that he could persevere through the self-education and character rebuilding that made him what he is. Sure, you find inherent talent and raw luck in these people's stories and some old-fashioned ambition, but they became who they are by imagining being different people from the ones who were doing the imagining which comes to the next takeaway. Maybe the self you imagine will take on a radically different profession, but there are plenty of part-time openings for the self-invented as well. A new way of doing your work, a new specialty, maybe an amateur form of work in the old honorific sense of the term. A transactional lawyer might help run a nonprofit and maybe even take on litigation for an indigent client. A public litigator might start a, a, a business. In this regard, here's a quick old graduation memory. Most of you know the work of the great constitutional thinker John Hart Ely. You may not remember that he was the dean of this law school in the 1980s. John was a wise and witty man and a wry observer of the world he grew up in, what he called the American establishment generation of the complacent 1950s. He spoke at this very event when I was a young faculty member. He had just received the 25th year reunion book from his Princeton class of 1960, what he described as the paragon of the Old Eastern establishment, all male, almost all white, thoroughly buttoned down. The reunion book, as many do, asked the if you had to do it all over again question, the one designed to provoke some wild whimsy, some let it loose, could have been retrospective self-imagining. John found the book an unexpected sociological treasure, if something of a downer. 
He did a cross check of the entries and discovered that there were two dominant groups, the investment bankers who said they wished they had become commercial bankers and the commercial bankers who said vice versa. <laughs> Needless to say, my takeaway is you can and will do better than this. <laughs> Try to make some preemptive, if you had to do it all over, projections. Maybe write an updated law school application statement every few years. I want to say something about the legal profession, and now here's another big cliche or pair of cliches. The notions that the lawyers do the means, the clients have the ends. The positive version is the often reverently solemn view of the lawyer's role zealous commitment to helping clients fulfill their interests. The cynical version is that lawyers will do anything to advance their clients' interests. Obviously, the positive version is a good idea, while it's unfortunate the extent that the latter is true or perceived to be true. But this means ends business misses a lot, because those interests, whether economic self-interest or moral or political interests, are also not sprung platonically or rigidly determined by circumstance, just like yourselves. Sometimes it is only with lawyers that clients or the public can come to recognize what their interests really are. Now, this may seem obvious at one level. A client says she wants to make a contract or start a company or get a divorce, and the lawyer lays out law-related costs and benefits to help her decide if that's what she really wants. But I'm thinking in larger terms. Case in point, as big a set of legal issues as we've seen in many years. I'm speaking of the very current roiling public debate about national security surveillance over our phone and email records. And I find it oddly reassuring that it's happening. It's one of those special moments when people and groups who usually act from ideological predispositions or political loyalties get all confused and conventional arguments get screwed up. By coincidence, this very month, the Supreme Court decided an issue about swabbing DNA from all arrestees for a big crime matching database. Of course, it was five to four, and of course, Justice Kennedy wrote the decision. But Justice Breyer sided with the state, and Justice Scalia scathingly sided with the defendant. Yes, night is day and up is down. <laughs> but it turns out that privacy is very hard. To some, it's a deontological value. But its form and degree are a matter of taste and social context, and matching it against other social needs, like crime solving, makes things even harder. On a bigger scale, with the NSA, NSA surveillance, there's a strange liberal conservative bedship fellowship on both or all sides of the debate. Is Edward Snowden a whistleblowing hero or a traitor? Hard to predict opinions on, on this by the usual ideological variables. Everyone wants the so-called right balance of security and privacy, but the balance can't be struck in the abstract or by any arithmetic or algebra. In any event, it's only by encountering the hard legal problems that people, including governments, confront how ill-formed their own supposedly pre-existing interests sometimes are. I don't want the government having my phone records, but I do want my phone company having the records because I wanted to do things with the records that I want done, and then I've acknowledged that I don't want to fully own the records. I want the government to protect us from bad people. I know I'm not a bad person, but I also know that the government has to risk some false positives if it is to get the really bad people. I want my internet company to protect my privacy, but I want it to help me have just as much private information as would please me, and I realize I can't instruct the provider on every data point of information. In fact, as some social scientists are proving, even when I seem to be in perfect control of my privacy, I do weird things, such as answering really invasive questions just because uh, the questions are slightly less invasive than the one before it, which I refuse to answer. <laughs> now, lawyers will be all over these questions, because whether it's to assist the courts or inform democratic voting, we need them to lay out and help us test the alternative schemes we must, cho must choose from. It's a matter of detail and judgment and accommodation. Lawyers help clients and the public figure out what their wants are only by helping them see what law necessarily follows from fulfillment of those wants. And the good news, and I say this with unabashed, arrogant smugness, is that it's our lawyers who were at the center of this. Last week's alumni news notes from the library reveals that our graduates are fully in the mix. Our grad, David Drummond, chief legal officer of Google, is rethinking the terms of contracts with his customers, clarifying that their privacy is protected in line with the law. 
but he's also arguing to the government that it needs to allow him to clarify with his customers the terms of those laws so that trying to tell government so tr trying to tell government that more trust in those contracts will help the government fulfill its interests. Our grad Mark Rotenberg, who runs the nonprofit Electronic Privacy Information Center, might concede that the NSA surveillance is consistent with Fourth Amendment doctrine and even the letter of the relevant statutes, but he's trying to convince Congress that it didn't realize the implications of those statutes. Our grad Susan Ilston, federal district judge, has rejected at least one government request of an internet company as so vague as to be illegal, but she's approved others because the law requires her to be scrupulous in examining the details. Our grad Peter Buchert, the heroic investigator for Human Rights Watch, has been looking at the question of extradition of Edward Snowden from Hong Kong. He's been writing about how Hong Kong's legal integrity may be compromised by its earlier involvement in the under-the-radar rendition of terrorist suspects to Middle Eastern countries. And our grad Ronald Noble, the head of Interpol, needs to draw on databases like that of the NSA as he investigates terrorism and human trafficking in Central Asia. By the way, fantasy job, head of Interpol, I'd like to say something really articulate and sophisticated about imagining myself in that job, but all I can say is, like, totally cool. <laughs> so, I hope I've made the case that law is in no way prosaic, but to close this effort, I'll make an abrupt shift from prose to poetry. I'm going to read a couple of poems. Here's one by a British poet named Shina Pyu. And the takeaway here has to do with the being open to change, which is my main concern for you. <laughs> what if this road that has held no surprises these many years decided not to go, go home after all? What if it could turn left or right with no more ado than a kite tail? What if its tarry skin were like a long, supple bolt of cloth that is shaken and rolled out and takes a new shape from the contours beneath? And if it chose to lay itself down in a new way around the blind corner, across hills you must climb without knowing what's on the other side, who would not hanker to be going at all risks? Who wants to know a story's end or where a road will go? The other poem is by a great American poet recently deceased, Robert Creeley. Uh, and he wrote it in 1973 for his child's lower school graduation, but maybe it works here. And the takeaway is stay connected here. The honor of hu being human will stay constant. The earth, earth, water, wet sun, shine, the world will be as ever round and all yourselves will know it. Will know it, on it, and around and around. No one knows what will happen. That is the happiness of the circle finding you. So the real takeaway is uh, stay connected with us. We'll leave a light on for you. We hope to see you soon. We'll, know you see, we'll see you a little later, and we know we'll remember you always. Thanks.